Hello, it's Scott Manley here. On Monday night, China's lunar exploration program took a huge step forward with the launch of Chang'e 5. This spacecraft is aiming to go to the moon, land on the surface and return a sample of the moon to the Earth. And this has not been performed since 1976 with the Luna 24 mission. So this is a monster spacecraft which is much more capable than those 1970s solar, uh, so, uh, Soviet spacecraft. It's 8.2 tons, it's multiple stages, multiple parts. To get this onto a translunar trajectory, they needed to use the largest rocket that China has, the Long March 5. And this is a, a big step up technologically for China. Previously, they've been working with these um, you know, hypergolic fueled boosters that are derived ultimately from ICBMs, but Long March 5 is is modern, it's a cryogenic rocket, has better performance, it's launched next to the sea from an island so that it drops its stages in, in the water rather than on land. Um, so yeah, it has four boosters around the outside which are high performance um, kerosene liquid oxygen boosters. The core is liquid hydrogen and there's two stages on that and that was able to launch the spacecraft towards the moon. So it's going to take a few days to get there. It's currently about 300,000 kilometers from the Earth, approaching the Moon right now. Um, when it gets to the Moon, it's going to perform multiple braking burns. So it's going to take several burns to actually break itself into lunar orbit, into a 200 kilometer orbit. And then when it's ready to land, it will slow itself down even more, putting its perilune about 15 kilometers above the surface. It will then detach the lander and the lander will perform an autonomous landing at the site. So the lander is actually is not dumb. It's full of scientific instruments. It's going to have uh, visual and infrared spectrometers to analyze the materials there. It's going to have a ground penetrating radar. So they're going to be able to pick and choose what samples they want to return. They have a drill which is able to drill two meters down. So that's comparable to the drilling capabilities of uh, previous sampling missions. And then all of this will be loaded into a return vehicle. So the return vehicle sits on top of the lander and it's about 120 kilograms. So I believe it gets pushed off by springs initially because they want to preserve the lander for as long as possible. And yeah, 120 kilograms pushes the hardware into orbit. That's about 250 pounds, by the way, if you're speaking Imperial. And I think this makes it the smallest rocket able to reach orbit from the surface of a planetary body. And I say planetary as in something that's been spherical. Uh, from there, it doesn't go all the way back to Earth on its own. The orbiter, which has been hanging out there the whole time, it will creep up and rendezvous with the spacecraft, with the return, well, with the capsule, dock, and then transfer the samples into a return capsule, a re-entry vehicle. After that, they'll detach the docking adapter, and the orbiter with the return capsule will remain in orbit until the planets align and it begins its journey home, probably in the first couple of weeks of December. It'll take a few days to fall down through the gravity well. Until it arrives at Earth, it will detach the re-entry capsule. The re-entry capsule is very similar in design to the Shenzhou or Soyuz style capsules. It will use a skip re-entry, which means it will use aerodynamic forces. Once it hits the atmosphere, it will curve its trajectory upwards. So it has a period of intense heating and braking, and then a second, it'll skip up and then fall back for a second period of heating. And this is apparently easier on the heat shield. So uh, ultimately it will end up landing under parachute in Inner Mongolia, where there will be teams on hand ready to recover the samples and put them into you know stable, secure, facilities to make sure they are not contaminated by anything from the planet Earth. So yeah, this is a you know quite a complicated vehicle. It's going to be the first rendezvous, first sorry, first automated rendezvous in lunar orbit. Obviously every time Apollo did it there were people at the controls when uh, Luna 24 went to the moon, it was a much simpler design. It was only able to return if it landed in a specific place. They had to pick the landing spot on the moon so that when Luna took off vertically, it would like just be able to go in a straight line and end up on a return trajectory for Earth. With being able to rendezvous in lunar orbit and then pick the return time, they are able to you know pick their landing site 
And this means that apparently when Chang'e 5, if it's a success, there is a backup spacecraft called Chang'e 6, predictably. And with that, if it works, they will send it to the lunar south pole and get polar samples as well, hoping to find more evidence for water. Having said that, of course, the Soviet spacecraft Luna 24 in 1976, it returned 170 grams of material. And some of this, when analysed, apparently showed evidence for water, but many people at the time dismissed this evidence because they thought it was the result of ground contamination because they thought that the moon was far too dry and could not possibly have any water in it. Okay, so the landing site is interesting. It's a place called Mons Rukmer. What they wanted to do was get some of the youngest material on the moon. So like the Apollo missions, they went to places like the Sea of uh, Tranquility, the Ocean of Storms. Well, Mons Rukmer is in the middle of the Ocean of Storms, also known as Oceanus Procellarum, and it's basically a volcano. And according to spacecraft that have surveyed the moon and looked at it through spectrometers, it's believed that this is a lava flow or a mount lava you know, volcano that has high levels of radiological materials, things like... Um, uranium and thorium, potassium, things that could have kept the moon warm. So it's believed that this came up through the, the sea of ocean of storms and formed a volcano, possibly as recently as a billion years ago, and it may have been driven by radiogenic heating from these materials. Now, uh, the Apollo spacecraft, they were looking for nice, easy places to land. This is an automated spacecraft. They are quite confident in their navigation capabilities, so it looks like they are going to try and land on something, uh, something like this if they can. It's the spacecraft itself is fully autonomous. It's going to use you know lidar, radar. It's going to use image processing to you know feature identification to try and pick out a landing site and put itself down on the surface. Now they're going to have a limited amount of time to perform this sampling operation. The spacecraft is entirely solar powered and isn't expected to last the lunar night. So the sun rises over the site, I believe, tomorrow. If you look, by the way, at the moon you know, tomorrow night, the ocean of storms, if you're in the northern hemisphere, is the dark area on the left side of the moon, as viewed from the northern hemisphere. If you're in the south, it's on the other side. Um, and Mons Rukmer is going to be in there. So that's where you that's where they're waiting for. Therefore, they can't land there until daylight comes. And then they have you know two weeks of daylight to make sure that they can perform their sampling, power their instruments, drill down, get that, and then return it to space. It's possible that this spacecraft, uh, this probe, this lander continues to work after lunar night, but I wouldn't count on it. Um, also, by the way, in terms of reusing hardware, I've heard that it's entirely possible that they they might be considering to reuse the return, uh, the propulsion vehicle, the service module. This has happened in the past where they did a test with a service module and then they swung it back out to the moon. It flew past the, you know, the Earth and back out towards the moon. I'm not sure what they would do with it, but if it's hardware in space, they might, you know, they might figure out how to preserve it. I mean, there's been a lot of stuff in the Chang'e spacecraft where they've tried to, you know, do new things with it. And Chang'e 1 was, of course, just a simple lunar orbiter, and they built Chang'e 2 as a backup. But after, after Chang'e 2 went to the moon, it performed a number of orbits, and then decided to leave the moon, headed out to a Lagrange point, and for one of the first spacecraft to visit a Lagrange point, and then they used some good old gravity assist to fly out and intercept the asteroid Tutatis and get some close-up views of that. Now, Chang'e 3 and 4 were obviously lunar rovers, with Chang'e 4 being the first to land on the far side of the moon. But yeah, Chang'e 5 is uh, the lander, the sampler. It's, a, it's hoping this will work. This is very cool. Um, if it doesn't, Chang'e 6 is already pretty much built, as far as I understand. And they will have a future opportunity to fly that. If it if Chang'e 5 is successful, they will be able to pick another landing site, which will be pretty darn cool as well. 
Another interesting thing, by the way, is that this spacecraft on the way to the moon has obviously been transmitting and talking to ground control. The European Space Agency has also been helping uh, coordinate with China to make sure that they can track this. But amateur radio observers have been doing their own thing. And of course, they've done their usual stuff of getting Doppler information, tracking information, and they have been able to receive telemetry signals and decode TV data. Uh, the TV data was apparently in a standard format, so we've got this sort of totally, uh, you know, uncurated engineering data sh uh, camera showing the solar panels and dust, which is pretty amazing. But yeah, uh, it's expected that the spacecraft will be returning the capsule to the Earth in December 17th. Round about the same time, by the way, Japan will be returning their sample capsule from Ryugu, so we're getting a whole bunch of Andromeda strain potentialities coming. Just kidding. No, it, seriously, it, December is going to be the month where we return you know, two different samples from alien worlds back to the Earth. It's going to be complicated, it's going to be tricky. You know, Luna 23 can tell you just how hard landing on the moon can be. Hopefully Chang'e 5 doesn't go through that, and hopefully we get a sample back on the Earth just in time for Christmas. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.